Hi, thanks for joining me as we answer five of the most common questions I get about Night Stalkers number four, Takeover at Midnight. Warning, there will be spoilers. First, Lola and Tim were a real new adventure for me as an author. Um, the, the other people that I'd written before were very clearly who they were. They were very good. They were forthright. They were, or they were villainous or something. But Lola and Tim are both deeply conflicted. They're both practical jokers, which I'm not. Um, and trying to find their voices took me a number of tries. It was actually rather interesting when I first submitted this book to the publisher. She rejected it. She said, I'd accept this from anyone else, but it's not good enough for you. Um, because I hadn't found Lola and Tim's voices yet. I hadn't found their joy of play mixed and contrasted with the chaos that they go through internally. So they're so messed up internally that they're they're like putting this happy, carefree chaos facade out front, and the evolution of those those two characters <laughs> and the author uh, took me quite a bit of fussing around to actually bring them to life the way I felt they should be on the page. So that's a little bit about Lola and Tim. Desert One, which is at this center of this story for somewhere in the middle um, was the attempt by the U.S. to rescue the hostages that Iran had taken when the Shah fell and the religious regime came in and Ayatollah Khomeini took over the country. And it was an utter from the first day fiasco. They I put a lot of the facts in the story itself, but the real issue was that everybody wanted to be a part of the rescue. Navy, Air Force, Army, everybody wanted to have their piece of it. So what they did was they proceeded to throw all these different assets at it, but these there'd never been coordination like this between the different branches of the military before. The Air Force would be called in in Vietnam to, you know, do an airstrike by the Army, but this was a deeply coordinated effort that had to be completely clandestine, and all the pieces had to work. So the Navy's portion was they wanted to provide the helicopters. Well, their helicopters were all geared for dealing with sea air, the Army's helicopters and helicopter pilots had all been trained in land warfare. But the Navy got in and they got their Navy helicopters in there. And a number of them failed in the route. They hit a dust storm and the it just it kept getting worse and worse. And finally, there were enough broken helicopters they decided to abort. Well, to abort, they had to refuel the helicopters They'd landed way in the deep in Iran, out in the desert, and some C-130 Hercules tanker planes had landed there, and they were supposed to pump the fuel across. Well, what happened was the helicopters lifted up, created a brownout, which they didn't know how to deal with, and they essentially flew into the back of one of the tanker planes. And massive explosions, people died, equipment was just abandoned equipment that Iran is actually still flying today. Uh, and this was 40 years ago now. Then what happened was, so they, they finally got all this equipment and people and most of the bodies eventually uh, back out, but they didn't free the hostages. The thing that got interesting here was that Jimmy Carter was, work, was president at that point. He was working very hard to get the hostages out. It turns out that somebody from Ronald Reagan's election campaign said, you really want us in power, not Carter. So if you do us a favor, don't release the hostages until the day after the election. And that's exactly what they did. I don't 
I don't know quite what Reagan offered them, but uh, that's the reason the hostages were trapped for so long was because of the Reagan campaign. But the interesting spinoff of this was the army finally went, or the U.S. military finally went, oh, we need some way to be able to do things like this without it turning into a disaster. Long distance overland rescue, long distance coordination. And the first thing that was built was the, it didn't start out as the 160th, but what eventually became the 160th Special Operations Regiment, SOAR, which is the Night Stalkers. And they worked on coordinated helicopter flight at night over hostile terrain, below radar flight, nap of earth flying, all those skills that we pass about so easily were invented because of this disaster out there. They also put together the Special Operations Command, which went, okay, let's coordinate more tightly between the different services to get everything to function better when there is a disaster like this. So all that got born out of this bad spot in the desert during a regime change uh, because we had supported the Shah and the Ayatollah Khomeini did not. Um, so when I was writing this book some 30 years after the hostage crisis, uh, Iran was, it was actually being a very interesting place. And I had some hopes that I wanted to capture in this book. It had been up until that point, it had been led very strongly by the religious charismatic. It had been led by Ayatollah Khomeini, hardline, U.S. is evil, which having instilled the corrupt Shah for so many decades upon their country, it's hard to argue with. Um, but around the time I wrote this book, they elected a, a slightly reformist president, and he was approved by the Ayatollah because he wouldn't have been allowed to serve if he hadn't been, uh, despite any elections. But it gave this window of hope, of possibility that maybe there would be a softening. And I that's what I incorporated into the book. Um, and that hope was, it shows up here in communication, but we didn't see it, it carry through. And it might have carried through if Israel had stopped assassinating their nuclear scientists and blowing up their centrifuges and we hadn't imposed massive sanctions because they got close to being nuclear capable. Um, they probably are nuclear capable and just smart enough to be quiet about it. But anyway, I wanted to, just like in Daniel's Christmas when there was the regime change in North Korea, I wanted to capture that hope and see, let us think more positively about what's going on in the world. Clearly that didn't carry through in North Korea or yet in Iran. I still have hope that we'll find more peaceful solutions. Uh, but that's that's one of the things I always try to capture in every book is is some way to look at the world more positively and to look with hope and try to embrace that. Now, one of the things that has sort of been lurking in the background of the series as we go through here is back in book one, I introduced a character, Colonel Michael Gibson, and he's the best Delta Force soldier there is which pretty much makes him the best soldier there is, period. Uh, and we see Michael sort of wandering through the background of these episodes, of each book. And I, <laughs> when I created him, I didn't know how much people would get attached to him. By the end of book one, he had... He'd made a name for himself, and suddenly fans were saying, when do I get him? When do I get him? Well, I already had a plan that I mentioned in one of the earlier videos of 
the four seats of the helicopter of the Black Hawk helicopter were already laid out as a series. And so the little birds, which were going to be book five and six, were going to be, I finally decided that's where I would end with Michael at number six. Not end the series, but end the little birds. But I'd like to take a moment with, this is the first book where we really see Delta Force stepping up and becoming central to the story. One of the things these guys are known for, one of the things they train for, one of the things they recruit for is out of the box. These guys, when they attack, it's like nothing you've ever seen. I've watched a few video demonstration videos. They don't release much. Uh, and I've read every book out there I can lay my hands on. And their thinking is so non-structured military. It's very creative. It's very dynamic. It's actually the word they use now for their kind of a, an attack. It's When they go dynamic, they go extremely dynamic. Um, and there was some general who went to see a demonstration and he left his car out in front of the uh, building they were supposed to attack. And they didn't tell Delta Force it was a test. They just said, hostages in that building and they came in so fiercely and so strongly basically destroyed the building freed the hostages from and uh, just like it was like a lightning strike is the way the general described it and I believe his car was destroyed as part of the process because he left it too close so that's what Delta Force is is they're the most creative thinkers in the military on how to counteract terrorism. That's their their primary purpose is counterterrorism. Now, two of the things that the military protects very closely is how you get in information on how to infiltrate and how to exfiltrate. And that's insertion of troops and pulling out troops, recovering them. And the one that they really protect is the exfiltration, the techniques that they use to get people out from deep behind the lines, from deep undercover assignments, from black ops. How do they extract them? So throughout my series, you'll see that how they escape various things. It's all made up because I couldn't find any sign of it anywhere. It really is very well protected. So when Michael and his team pull out of that Iranian bioweapon site and they do it with motorized bicycles and stealing cars and that's, that's pure author. I have no idea how they would actually do it. I'm sure they have and I'm sure it's much more exotic than what I did. But Michael is... The, he, this is where he, the book, he really started stepping it up and becoming a force in the series. And he was just such a joy to write. He really was. And it gave me a chance to delve more into Delta Force. And lastly, one of the things I get asked about is why the, did I do the families the way I did? Lola is from a severely dysfunctional mom's dead dad's beyond low life jerk um, and Tim is from this happy cl tight close family that he doesn't feel he belongs to uh, Lola was raised by a brothel madam who wouldn't let her work with the girls but brought her up to in the kitchen and Tim was raised in the kitchen of a very high-end restaurant. So it was these family dynamics where Lola doesn't believe in them at all, and Tim believes he doesn't belong. But it's also this awful, awful family and this wonderful, wonderful family. And I did that on purpose. I wanted to have that be a real tension between them and as they struggle around to become a couple, <laughs> uh, 
I wanted them to have to come to terms with their differing pasts and the differing dynamics of that. And I really wanted to show it also for us, for people. Again, it's that, that sign of hope. It's like they found a way to create family and to form family and to become complete. And I just, I love that part of romance. I love that, yeah, the, the perfect couple and the happy ever after, it belongs in the paper. But, or ebook, either or. But I love the, the concept of we have a higher goal to aim at and that we can keep aiming at it and keep moving closer and closer with time. So that's why I really focused on family in this book. That's it. That's my answer to five questions about Takeover at Midnight. Uh, please visit my website at mlbuckman.com. There's fan club freebies, bonus scenes and stories, including a link to this video, uh, and recipes from the books. And it's going to keep growing. I, my goal is over the next couple of years to just keep adding fun stuff to my site because I love having fun. So... Take care. Thanks for watching.